every flyby of Io, new, fresh eruptions were discovered, where volcanoes had transformed landscapes first photographed by Voyager over 10 years before. Io was still awash with active volcanoes. These kind of uh, volcanic eruptions don't happen on Earth anymore. So that Io was very much like the Earth was back in its earliest history with maybe lava oceans and uh, volcanism that's, that's happening all over the place with a lot of intensity. Um, this is giving us a window into what the early Earth was like. Io is astonishingly volcanically active. Every square foot of Io's surface has 40 times as much heat coming out of it as an equivalent area on the Earth. And in fact, one of Io's volcanoes, the volcano Loki, the most powerful volcano on Io, just that one volcano is putting out almost as much heat as the entire planet Earth. Such huge amounts of heat defied physics. Io should have cooled down long ago. Something was still generating heat inside this tiny moon. The power of Jupiter's gravity is pulling the surface up and down maybe by 100 meters every day. And in fact, it's this continual distortion of Io that is heating the interior and producing this frenetic volcanic activity. But even Jupiter's immense gravitational pull couldn't account for all this heat. And closer scrutiny of data from Galileo might yet help to explain where all this energy is coming from. But perhaps planetary geologists won't know for sure why Io is so active until a mission lands on its surface. Flying over the surface of Io would be an amazing sight. The surface is so varied, there are these vast featureless plains. You would have huge mountains coming up over the horizon, very rugged mountains, some of them twice as high as Everest. You'd have these plumes that you could see on the skyline, blasting material hundreds of miles into the air. You'd see the glow of red hot or white hot lava on the surface below you. You see these huge volcanic craters. It would just be an amazing sight. Nothing has ever landed on Io. No robots and certainly no humans. But thanks to the voyagers and the Galileo spacecraft's flybys of the little moon, mission scientists have a pretty good idea what the colors and landscapes would look like from the surface. It's a spectrum of browns, ochres, and deep, deep reds. Appear to be allotropes of sulfur. These are primitive lava flows, all right. It's a throwback to Earth's early history. I'm standing on a silicate crust. It's covering the sulfur in places, but it's weak. My feet are breaking through. As the surface is, is being distorted by Jupiter, I'm sure it's going to be creaking and groaning all the time with, with this enormous distortion, and you get incredible seismic activity. <sighs> We see these huge plumes of dust and gas being blasted off into space. Um, it just would be an incredible place. The views might be spectacular on Io, but it's the things you can't see that would pose the most danger for an astronaut on the surface. Rads have picked up. Look at that interference. Scrub the EVA. We're picking up increased radiation readings, and we need you to return to Hermes. Your spacesuit offers you very little protection okay. in, in intense radiation fields, and uh, somewhere like the surface of Io is just lethal to you, just from the radiation fields that you would experience. Uh, and radiation causes problems because it, it, it damages the, your DNA, the blueprint for, for the rest of your body, it can cause mutations, can lead to cancers. You're doing a great job, Zoe. That suit is a disaster. It's too heavy. It's too much radiation getting through. If you don't protect yourself, you're going to run into problems very quickly. I'm not clear how we can get round that, possibly by active shielding. Until such a technology becomes a reality, future exploration of Jupiter and its moons will be done with robots. Beyond Jupiter, another giant gas planet beckoned. Saturn. Things had been quiet at Voyager Mission Control as they waited patiently for the two spacecraft to cross the void. But as the ringed world drew closer, excitement started to rise again. Ed Stone was at Mission Control. 
I can remember as we were getting the first small images of Saturn, just little tiny images with the rings, you could just barely see the rings. But as we got closer and closer, we began to see the rings in a way that you, no one had ever seen before. The voyagers flew right through the ring plane, transmitting their unique encounters back to Earth. Astronomers had dreamt of this moment for over 300 years. We believe the rings are the result of a large moon which was blown apart by a collision. This is just the debris. Particles range in size from dust to fragments, well, the size of a bus. These particles have hit each other over millions of years and are probably fairly soft uh, and irregular in shape because of all the collisions. Another thing we discovered was the incredible waves on Saturn's rings created by the wakes of moons. We could use the rings and the waves of the rings to actually know there was an unseen moon, and that helped us focus to see where we could discover the moon. And that will be an exciting thing to do in the future. The Voyager's encounter with Saturn transformed our view of the rings, but it was a fleeting flyby of the planet. Those stunning images they took are now over 20 years old. A return to Saturn was long overdue. Cassini left Earth in 1997 on its seven-year flight to reach Saturn. The two-ton spacecraft was the largest planetary probe ever launched by NASA, and it's the smartest robotic explorer to head for the planets. Once orbiting Saturn, more than three hours away from the help of mission control, the probe should be able to sort out many of its own problems. Cassini will get back to Saturn and will go into orbit, so it will have time to really study the rings in detail and learn a great deal more about the waves and to look for all of these moons which are creating the ripples on the rings. A visit to Saturn's rings a billion miles from the Sun demands a spacecraft that's able to withstand the extreme cold of deep space. Here at these labs in the UK, planetary spacecraft are tested to these limits before leaving Earth. And inside this chamber, the temperature is approaching that at Saturn. Carl Murray is an expert on planetary rings, and he's planning the trajectory that Cassini is taking through the frozen realms of Saturn. For today, he's experiencing the severe chill of deep space for himself. The walls of this chamber are below minus 150 degrees centigrade and the air that's rushed in from outside is freezing to the ceiling and falling as snow. Cassini will have to endure conditions even colder than this for its whole Saturn mission. <sighs> it's difficult to breathe at times. Colder than the coldest winter's day I've ever experienced, I think. It's certainly cold enough for me. There are still fundamental things about the frozen rings of Saturn that aren't understood. Their age, their lifespan, how much longer they'll last. Everything says it should be more than one or two hundred million years. If we could confirm that, it means either we're living at a very special moment in time, when we're lucky enough to be alive as a species to see this beautiful ring system, or perhaps the ring system is locked in some way that we don't understand, perhaps Cassini could tell us how, or perhaps rings come and go when we're just looking at the latest version of Saturn's rings. After seven years of journeying from Earth, Saturn began to loom in Cassini's cameras in the summer of 2004. And the best views of this jeweled world ever witnessed are now pouring back to Earth. The new tour of Saturn, its rings and moons, has begun. To be able to get up every morning and go and look at these images and uh, 
it, it's a real privilege for me, but it's basically for, for all our species. We as a species are sending a spacecraft into orbit around the, a planet in the outer solar system. And I'm, I'm just so happy that I'm able to participate in that and hopefully unravel some of the, the puzzles that Voyager posed for us. That would be brilliant. Further out beyond Saturn, the record-breaking voyages continued their historic tour of the planets, visiting Uranus and Neptune. Today, they are still in regular contact, more than 8 billion miles from Earth. Monitored from these offices in LA, their power will keep them going until at least 2020 as they sail into the record books. But there was one outer planet that they didn't visit. We missed Pluto because Pluto is a little bit out of the plane of the planets. So Voyager 2, which had to stay in the plane to go by Uranus and Neptune, could not visit Pluto. And Voyager 1, which could have, was going up at the wrong angle. And that meant that we could not go on to Pluto with Voyager 1. So we had to leave something for the next generation. Pluto defines the edge of the domain of the planets. It's over 18,000 times further from the Earth than our moon and marks the gateway to trillions of other tiny ice worlds which are just beginning to be discovered. Out here, in these frozen wastes of the solar system, at the limits of the Hubble telescope, our views of this distant world are tantalizingly blurred. Even there, it's just a tiny dot. We can barely see details on it, but the details we can see show these very extreme contrasts between bright and dark. But it's all really fuzzy, and it's not until we go there with a the spacecraft we'll be able to see that clearly. Even without visiting Pluto, astronomers can still work out what the surface of this faraway planet might be like. As we go out in the solar system, we things obviously get colder as we get further from the sun. You see whole planets made of this stuff, just water ice, and uh, with some dirt mixed in with them. As you go even further out towards Pluto, then the, the ice becomes essentially like rock. It's so cold, but you get other ices, other kinds of snow. So the air around us here on, on the Earth, the nitrogen in the air, is present on Pluto, but it's frozen as an ice on the surface. So you get snow like this, but it would be made of nitrogen rather than water. We're now working on a mission to Pluto called New Horizons that will be launched in just a couple of years, but will then take uh, probably about 10 years to get to Pluto. And it's really a scary kind of process that we've sp already spent a decade planning this mission. We have a couple more years to go, a very intense work on designing the spacecraft, making everything work. Then we have a 10 year cruise and then we get all our data in about two hours as we fly past in 2015 or 2016. And everything has to work right. We have no way of slowing down and going back. If, we, if something goes wrong, we're just out of there. We've, we've lost the whole mission. So we're very, very focused on making sure everything works perfectly during those critical two hours, 10 years from now. With the immense distances and harsh extremes of space, Robots might be more suited to exploring the planets on our behalf. But there's one thing they will never be able to do, and that is experience the adventure, as we all did when men first set foot on another world. People you meet say, I was three years old or five years old, and my mother got me out of bed to watch Neil Armstrong step on the moon. That's a shared experience, and I think one of the beauties and one of the benefits of sending humans is that they can all relate to the human being there. Until we decide to send humans away from Earth once more, this shared experience of being on another world will have to come from our imaginations and the information beamed back from our robotic missions. But one day, we might just follow them again on a real space odyssey to the planets. This has been a presentation of Discovery Science Channel on the BBC, world-class television.